We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Hello friends, did you know that whenever you sign up as a patron of Australian True Crime, you'll have access to the back catalogue of exclusive extra episodes featuring Ron Idles, Charlie Bazina, Narelle Fraser, Jamel Wells and gorgeous Vaughan, our retired Pentridge guard among others. These are all the special episodes you'll only hear by signing up for $2 or $5 US a month by the way and we also have some nice book giveaways, we also have events that you get to buy tickets to first and all that sort of stuff. So please sign up very soon. Like all these good people, Caroline, Lucy Dyson, Tom Hunter, Jetta Ford, Caroline Hall, Kumsia David, beautiful name, Kumsia, Lisa Lusted. God, fancy if your name was Lisa Lusted. Michelle Bowes, Fiona Pemberton, and this week's favourite, Cynthia Zapardo. Okay, on with the show. The following podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature and is not suitable for children. She'd gone out back to the boat and crept up behind him. Bob wasn't frightened of her because he knew her. She got this big wrench and whacked him on the head, got him out cold, lashed him to a fire extinguisher, dragged him up using the boat winches onto the deck, lowered him into the bobbing dinghy, and it was very rough that night, and then went out into the middle of the the channel and threw him overboard and then went back to the boat and cleaned it all up and went home. Murder on the Derwent is the latest book by one of Australia's most prolific true crime authors and one of my favourites, Robin Bowles, who joins me on the show today. This fantastic book is the story of one man's mysterious disappearance under what were no doubt brutal circumstances that he didn't deserve. But it's become a story of tragedy for two women from the same small city, but from different sides of the tracks. Their paths would likely never have crossed were it not for the decisions made by their men on Australia Day 2009. One man insisted on spending the night alone after an argument. The other insisted on trying to take what wasn't his. A decade later, both women continue to live in fear of the consequences of the men's decisions that night. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims and what happens next. Author Robin Bowles has developed a close friendship with one of those women, Sue Neil Fraser, and her book is an insider's account of Sue's extraordinary story. But unbelievably, because Tasmania's a small place, Robin also had a personal connection dating back many years with the man at the centre of the mystery, Bob Chappell. My mother used to live next door to Bob Chappell and his first wife and she had a fall in her backyard on a very steep slope they lived in West Hobart. Your mum did? My mum, yes. And she was in her late 70s at the time. She fell over and broke her leg very badly, tibia and fibula, fibula, and uh, she couldn't get up. And so she spent the cold night on the ground oh, in, how terrible. in the yard. Yes, because I I lived away. I mean, I was there in Hobart, but yeah. I I lived didn't see I didn't go and see her all the time. And the next day, Bob came home to get some things because uh, he um, he and his wife Yvonne were splitting up, and he heard my mother with her little voice going help help. So he picked her up off the ground and rang an ambulance and rang me because he um, he and I both worked at the Royal Hobart Hospital at the time. So I was a nurse there and he was a radiation physicist in the uh, cancer area. And, uh, and I really believe that he saved her life. So that was Gosh. a long time ago. It was probably around about 1978 or 79. So I had that connection and I didn't know Sue uh, but my sons remembered, who, they still live in Hobart, and they remembered this story of this bloke who helped Grandma. Mm. And when all this blew up, 
one of my sons said to me, Mum, you should have a look at this case because, you know, it's really weird. And this guy's disappeared off the boat and, you know, his wife's done it. And I said, how do you know? And he said, oh, well, you know, they had some poor police officer looking at the CCTV cameras along Sandy Bay Road and uh, for hours and they saw her car. I said, oh, did they get the number plate? He said, no, no, but it was her car, you know, it was her car. So... It came to me then that about half of Hobart believed that Sue had killed her her partner, 16 years, and the other half didn't. So Sue that you're Mm -hmm. talking about is Sue Neil Fraser, who was the de facto, right? They they never got married. No, they never married. So she was the partner of Bob Chappell by this stage. And in 2009, they were out on their yacht. Yes. They had actually bought the yacht in Queensland and and, um, both of them were going to sail it down. But unfortunately, Bob had a very bad nosebleed on the boat. So the skipper, they they, um, had engaged two people to help them sail the boat to Hobart. So the skipper put ashore, I think, in Bega and uh, said that he wanted Bob to go to hospital. He, He didn't want the responsibility of crossing the Bass Strait with someone who may or may not be, you know, well. Because how old was Bob? He looks Uh, quite elderly in the photos. No, he's not actually that old. He was in his mid to late 60s when when this happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably old to you, but it's not to me. Uh, (laughs) Okay, fair enough. (laughs) And um, so, uh, but he was a small man and he had all that fuzzy hair and the pipe and the stoop book and a bit of a shuffle and, you know, he looked like a scientist, you know. And um, so he was a small, you know, I think he weighed 65 kilos. Oh, little. came out later. Yeah. And um, so uh, they put Bob ashore and Sue stayed on the boat and sailed the boat into Hobart and Bob flew home. So after the uh, arrival of the boat, which caused a great kerfuffle in Hobart because it was the biggest boat in the marina, the biggest boat in Hobart actually. Wow. And um, it was moored quite a long way offshore because it needed a, a deep mooring. So it was actually moored right on the edge of where the shelf goes out from the shore and then it drops away into a very deep channel, which has a lot of current, and um, it's the Derwent Estuary. So um, the, they did one trip to Bruny Island uh, with the family, and the reason they bought a big boat was that they... Uh, wanted to use it as a sort of floating shack and take the kids with them on weekends away and that sort of thing. Lovely. Um, And when I went on board much later, I was amazed at how big it was actually. You know, it had a had a kitchen that would make most people a bit envious. Um, you know, I mean, it, better than you get in most apartments these days. Wow. And a big saloon and then I think three or four um, bunk, you know, bunk rooms, bedrooms. And it was a big boat. And... Um, in my opinion, much too big for Sue and Bob to have handled on their own. And I think Bob's family felt the same way, Bob's kids. Uh, and, I, of course, I knew them since they were little because they lived next door to my mother, so I knew them all. Um, so they weren't very um, they weren't very happy about this purchase and they felt that Sue had sort of bulldozed Bob into making the decision. Mm. There was a lot wrong with the boat and a n- number of those things became apparent in the sail down. And uh, so... So Bob, because he'd sort of missed out on the sail down, felt that he would like to be able to potter on the boat and, and you know, fix some of these things. And so on this particular day, which was Australia Day weekend, Australia Day, uh, they had gone out to Bruny Island as a family the day before and Bob's sister was visiting from interstate, from actually from overseas, and she went too. And um, so on Australia Day... Uh, Bob and Sue both went out to the boat in the morning. Sue, Sue left the boat to go and do some stuff and then she went back about midday, uh, a bit later maybe. And uh, No, it was 2 o'clock, sorry, I, I take that back. So mm-hmm. she went back around about 2. She was seen leaving the leaving the beach and, in fact, assisted to get her um, her rubber ducky out of the sand because she'd left it at the high water mark. What's a then, rubber ducky? That's the boat, the plastic? Yeah, a little, one of those little inflatables. Thing. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's, like, it's an inflatable. Yeah. It was actually a Zodiac, but I, mm-hmm. I'm sorry I call them rubber duckies, but it was a, it was a Zodiac. <laughs> and um, so she went back out to the boat and Bob was in a grumpy mood, didn't really want her around. He said, look, I think I'll stay on the boat tonight and you go home. So she left him hmm. his her mobile phone hmm. and went back to the beach. Now, one thing that anyone who knows anything about sailing knows that um, if there's no dinghy attached to a boat when it's moored, usually there's no one on it oh. because most people don't let their dinghy 
go in case they need to get off the boat in an emergency or they get tired of being there or any reason, but they generally keep the dinghy at the boat. So Bob's out on the yacht alone at, on this at night. A mooring. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a mooring. Uh, what's a mooring again? Well, it's where they anchor the boat. So there's no. it's not like he's on a jetty or no, anything no, like no, that. No, 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 no. He's out, out in the middle of the water. He is, and the furthest boat out because of the size of the boat yeah. had to put a deep mooring Right, and he has no way of safely getting back to shore if anything happens to him. Well, he could have hailed. Uh, there are water taxis. Okay, and he could have also, if it was really desperate, he could swim because he was a good swimmer. It wasn't all that far, five hundred meters or something offshore. Right, um, but he's had a blue with Sue, yes. some kind of blue. Yes, and he's sent her back in the um, Zodiac, the inflatable, mm-hmm. and he wants to stay by himself on the boat. And so that's the way it is. Last last thing she knows, he's out there being a grump mm-hmm. and she's gone back onto shore. Sure. So later on the police asked her what she did then. Mm. And her story at the time was that she went to Bunnings Warehouse and looked around and they were needing some things for the boat, but she didn't actually buy anything. And then she said to the police she got home Uh, and it was getting dark when she got home. She didn't know what time it was. Now, on the 42nd uh, parallel, which is where Tasmania is, um, in the summer it gets dark pretty late, Mm. about 9.30 or so. Uh, So the thing was that because it was Australia Day, Bunnings closed at 6 o'clock. So the police went, aha, why did she lie about this? Then... There were other stories that she told the police that um, didn't do her any favours, but her daughter, Sarah, who's been her main champion to try and, you know, get this case reviewed right right from the beginning, uh, said that on the day that Bob disappeared, before she was asked questions about where she'd been and so on, her mother was given some Valium mm. and she was also very distraught because not knowing where Bob was because he just vanished off the boat and... Her day had started on the day after Australia Day by phone ringing at seven and um, the police, the water police, saying, you better, you and your husband had better come down because your boat's sinking. Right. So it was well down into the water and she said to the police on the phone, she said, oh, my God, my partner's on the boat. Mm-hmm. So that changed the whole momentum of the day and the, then it wasn't just the water police but it was other police and, and so on who were congregating on the boat to see whether Bob was there and, in, you know, incapacitated or what the story was. And so she's had a very stressful day. Very so stressful. I guess to her daughter's point, she's been woken by the phone mm-hmm. saying, you better get out here, your boat's sinking. She mm-hmm. said, what are you talking about? My partner's on the boat. Mm-hmm. So she's freaking out. Yes. And then as the day rolls on, they say, no, he's not. Now her partner's missing. Mm -hmm. They start medicating her with sedatives. Family does. Yes. The family does. Then they inter. Then the police interview her. Yes. She's sedated. She's stressed, and all of that. So is it any wonder she's a bit confused about timelines? And and she did say later that she went to Bunnings nearly every day. Now Sue was sixty four, I think, at the time, and you know I'm I'm seventy two. So you know we get uh, we get our days a bit muddled up when we're not working in a job. Yep. And um, it, you don't need to know whether it's Wednesday or Friday, to be honest. I mean, you just one day goes into the next. And they are renovating a boat, so That's you go correct. to Bunnings a lot. Oh, she did go to Bunnings nearly every day, mm. she said. So the other thing that had happened the night before, which is relevant and scary really, was that Sue was home on her own. She'd made a few phone calls to her daughter and her mother and then she received about 10 o'clock, she received a phone call from a man called Richard King. Now, Richard King introduced himself, because she and Bob didn't have a clue who he was, uh, by saying that he was a close friend and confidant of Bob's youngest daughter, Claire Chapel. And Claire has a few... Um, this is not a private thing. She, she has a few uh, mental illnesses. She's got a sort of bipolar uh, illness. Mm-hmm. And so he was counselling her, he said, when I later spoke to Claire, she said he's not my counsellor, he's only a friend and he takes more on than he should have. But um, he rang and asked to speak to Bob and Sue said he wasn't there and he said, Richard King said, uh, I'm worried because Claire has this premonition that something bad is going to happen to Bob and the boat mm. and she thinks the boat's going to sink and she needs reassuring that everything's okay. 
And Sue passed it off. She said, oh, look, you know, he's not here. Uh, don't be silly. You know, she's quite a practical lady, Sue. And um, and she she was fond of Claire, but she knew she was a little bit disturbed by things. And she hung up. But she did think it was a very weird phone call. And she suggested that he ring Tim Chappell, Claire's older brother, which he did. So those two phone calls came in the night before completely out of the blue with a very strange prediction that something bad was going to happen to Bob and the boat. <laughs> and nobody's really been able to explain that. And when I went to see Richard King much later when I was researching my book, uh, he lives in the country in, in uh, near the airport in Campania. And um, so I pulled my car off the road into the little driveway area that leads up to the big cyclone gate and, and called out a cooey because the house was sort of no, 50 metres up the up the drive and this guy popped his head out and I said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm Robin Bowles, I'm researching a book about the Neil Fraser case and he went back inside and then he walked down the drive with a gun over his arm, a rifle. It wasn't at me, it was, you know, over his arm and he said, get the F off my property or I'll, you know, I'll, I don't want to talk about it. So, of course, your natural reaction, well, mine was, when you see someone coming at you with a gun, you put your hands in the air. <laughs> Mm. And he goes, sorry, yes, I'm going, I'm gone. And I jumped in the car and went. So I've never actually interviewed him, um, but I did try. <laughs> so um, that was also another very strange thing that happened before the before the actual uh, event. Now, there were other things that happened subsequently that were quite strange and unexplained. And one of the key ones is the, the forensic issues because two major things happened. The Once it was obvious that... Bob had gone missing, um, the forensic people scrambled over the boat, by which time about 21 people had been on and off the boat with no foot protection, no gloves, no nothing. They'd mm. been, it was towed into Constitution Dock and pumped out and tied to the wharf. And so people on and off all afternoon, including Sue and her um, two daughters, and I think uh, Tim Chappell went aboard as well, and then n numerous police. So the police, um, uh, forensic people, swarmed over the boat and uh, they found all sorts of little bits and bobs, including a, quite a large area of DNA. Uh, it's been described as a saucer size. It's been described as a 50-cent size. It's a, it's a bit indeterminate about the actual size, but it was, it was large. And they found that on the starboard side of the boat... Um, what do you mean by DNA? Oh, sorry. What kind of sample? Uh, well, it was DNA. They didn't know what it was from, okay. but it was a, a direct transfer. It wasn't secondary, although later on the police said it was. And um, it was found on the starboard side of the boat near the entry of, of uh, to get on the boat from a, from a dinghy. Now, that's very relevant because when the boat was out at the mooring, the, the tide was coming in and so the boat swung around on its um, anchor with the starboard side, that's the right hand side, facing the shore. Mm -hmm. So if you went out to the boat in a dinghy, the natural thing to do would be to tie up in the lee of the boat because there was quite a lot of wind that night and go on board on that side. Mm. When it was towed into Constitution Dock, it was tied up on the port side of the of the. Um, boat, and so there was really no need for anyone to go right round the boat onto the other side of the boat. It was a big boat, as I've said. Uh, so that that sample was relatively uncontaminated because there weren't. And, and the police later said, "Oh, we had twenty-one people trooping through, and you know anyone could have walked through it." And and they said it was a secondary transfer, and they said that one of the police must have stepped in some vomit on the wharf and then walked it onto the boat. Mm -hmm. Now that was later. Um, that was later knocked on the head because um, the, uh, the the DNA transfer was a primary transfer, which means it came directly from the person who put it there. Yep. So <clears throat> anyway, that was that was to come later. All we knew at the time, or they knew at the time, was that there was an unidentified female DNA in this sample. Mm -hmm. it wasn't Sue. It wasn't any of her relatives. Nobody. Just unidentified. So that was one thing. The next thing was they found Sue's uh, dinghy, the Zodiac, um, washed up on the beach, not where she said she left it, 
and the police did luminol testing on the dinghy. And um, uh, they said that there was a huge reaction in the front of the dinghy, in the you know, in the in the within under the prow, in inside the dinghy, huge reaction which could have been blood. And in fact, they took photographs and. Uh, when Sarah, Sue's daughter, saw them during the trial, they were given to the jury, even she thought, oh, my God, poor Bob, it must have been a bloodbath because there was so much, it appeared there was so much blood in the in the basin of the dinghy. Yeah. So there's a luminol positive test. There's a DNA test. Uh, Bob's missing. There was blood in the boat, Bob's blood in the boat. Later, uh, it was attributed to the time he had the severe um, nosebleed. nosebleed yeah. But at the time, the police are going, you know, oh, gotcha, gotcha. There are all these gotcha moments that they were, mm-hmm. you know, adding up. The police basically decided that Sue had uh, done away with her husband. She'd gone out back to the boat and crept up behind him. And at the trial, the, the DPP, with absolutely no evidence whatsoever, uh, created this, this scene where Sue... Got on the boat. Bob wasn't frightened of her because he knew her. She got this big wrench and whacked him on the head, got him out cold, lashed him to a fire extinguisher, dragged him up using the boat winches onto the deck, lowered him into the bobbing dinghy, and it was very rough that night, as I said earlier, uh, and then went out into the middle of the, the channel and threw him overboard and then went back to the boat and cleaned it all up and went home. So that was that was the DPP scenario to the jury. And then he showed the jury the, the, you know, the dinghy with all the blood and and so on. Well, allegedly blood. Um, You need to know that luminol actually also reacts quite strongly with things like bleach Mm -hmm. and other chemicals. And it just glows and then it it goes. And um, there's different, I mean, I won't go into it now, but there's glowing and there's twinkling and there's all sorts of different possibilities of reading this luminol uh, reactions. But uh, to the jury... It, it must have looked like he was bleeding to death in the dinghy if he wasn't already dead, if yep. that makes sense. Well, and also at this point they haven't... Um, no, nobody has introduced any other character to the narrative. Well, not quite, because... We have we have the DNA yep. sample, but the police have said, well, no, there's 20-something people walking across. So that's been dealt with to a certain degree. Correct. And there is no other name, there is no other character introduced yet. Well... Before the trial, a young homeless girl called Megan Vass Mm. was arrested on a shoplifting charge. And uh, she she had been homeless since she was 15. I think she was about 18 or so when she was arrested or maybe 17. And the Tasmanian police, as a matter of course, do DNA testing so they have profiles of, of people. Do they? Yeah, they do. With every arrest? Every arrest. That's handy. It is handy. And, in fact, there's quite a lot of work going on now about national databases for, for um, DNA because, you know, with the, with the Bradley Murdoch issue, uh, case, which I covered years ago, mm. uh, they, were, they were looking at it then and trying to standardise the DNA databases across Australia so that if, you know, Megan had got on the boat in, in uh, Hobart but her DNA was on record in New South Wales, they'd still, it'd still ping. Mm. But at the moment, it's, that hasn't got there yet because there's too much politics and, you know, um, protecting their, ba- their ba- bases and all that. But anyway, she gave her DNA and it matched the sample on the boat. You can buy Murder on the Derwent from the bookshop on our website, australiantruecrimepodcast.com. After the break, we find out how Sue is holding up today. Coming up on Australian True Crime, a truly harrowing interview with Megan Vass, the teenage girl, now a young woman, who holds the key to Sue Neil Fraser's freedom. But first, Robin explains the different worlds Megan and Sue come from in Hobart. Her boyfriend, uh, he's a member of the Divine family in Tasmania and they're not very divine, I have to tell you. (laughs) But they're well-known family. They have a lot of people who are a bit edgy. And I I remember when I was writing, when I wrote the book, my solicitor, my barrister who's, who's, you know, queries things for me so I don't get into trouble. Mm. He said, but can you can you show that, you know, they're that sort of family? I said, oh, I'll just send you a few newspaper reports. <laughs> so 
Anyway, that stayed in. And um, so her boyfriend, uh, she was 15 at the time Bob disappeared, and her boyfriend was Sam Devine, who was about 18, and he was already well known for going on boats and stealing things when people weren't there. And right next to Bob's boat, you know, within Cooey, was a boat that a guy called Paul Rowe was living on, and he had a rap sheet as long as your arm as well. He was quite a, you know, a well-known a member of the underworld. There was another bloke who was on, on the shore living in his car who um, uh, was also part of a sort of group that uh, people who hung around the waterfront and, and um, when it suited them or when, when the opportunity arose, uh, you know, climbed onto desert, unmanned boats and made off with whatever was saleable, mainly for drugs. And some things were missing from Bob's boat, like the EPIRB system. Um, and, you know, that's probably only worth a couple of hundred on eBay. I think I looked it up. But, you know, a couple of hundred buys you some drugs and so on. So there were things missing from the boat. Mm. And um, so Megan Vass was then called to give evidence at Sue's trial. This is our girl who's pinged yes. uh, on the DNA database after she's been caught shoplifting. Correct. What does she reckon? Well, she came in and her, her boyfriend sat at the back of the court, just, you know, moral support, but probably to make sure she didn't say the wrong thing. And she was only in the witness box a very short time. The prosecutor said, have you ever been on that boat? No. Do you know anything about this? No. Uh, never was there. Never saw nothing. Da, da, da. Well, how'd your vomit get on it? Exactly. <laughs> but he didn't ask that question. And then the uh, defence guy got up and he did a pretty appalling job defending Sue and I can say that now because I can't defame him because he's died but I'm glad to be able to get it on you know across that mm. he did a really bad job so he got up and he asked her a couple of questions but nothing very pertinent and then she was excused then a little bit later, the defence found out some other things about the fact that she was hanging around with this team who were robbing boats and, and that sort of thing and, and asked to recall her and the judge wouldn't allow her to be recalled. So she wriggled off the, off the witness stand and raced out of the court with her boyfriend and went missing again. The reason that the defence wanted to recall her was that um, they found out in, a, in an adjournment after she'd given evidence, they were not told about this beforehand, that... She was living at a shelter, the Annie Kenny Shelter in Hobart, where if you're living there and you're going to go out, you have to sign a book. It's just part of the discipline they use for the young kids. And, and she signed herself out to a, an apartment in Mount Nelson to say she was going to spend the night with some friends in Mount Nelson. Now, when the police detective Sinnott in, interviewed her at a later date and, and uh, interviewed the Annie Kenny Shelter, he went to the um, to the address in Mount Nelson, which didn't exist, mm. and that was the night of Australia Day. So she was unable to account for her whereabouts on the night of Australia Day, and so, and and her boyfriend was never even asked where he was. They didn't do any interviews about that, and they didn't interview her either about her not being at that address. Well, when the defence counsel found out that in the in the adjournment after she'd given evidence, he sought for her to be recalled, but the judge refused. So the other thing that happened at the trial, of course, I said to you before, the jury was shown the, the um, photos of the boat, which had dodgy forensics all over it, as in, you know, it had this blue, big blue stain, but it wasn't blood. Uh, that came out much later in the process that we've mm -hmm. been through. And, um, but, you know, looking at it, they would think, Oh, my God, you know, that's terrible. Poor man. Uh, and what motive was offered ah, by the prosecution? Well, I've got a little, I've got a little litany that I, that I trot out mm. and I say, in relation to this trial, uh, crime, sorry, alleged crime against, against Bob, Sue had no motive. She had, there were no witnesses there was no murder weapon, so they couldn't determine cause of death. Mm. There was no body, so mm. they couldn't determine cause of death. Um, there was no confession. And uh, there, so there was just no evidence. Circumstantial is very flimsy. It was. So anyway, she was found guilty and she was found guilty and given a sentence of 26 years. That's extraordinary. Which was, you know, right out there. Yeah. And um, the judge... And most of the people in the courtroom didn't like her, including her own counsel. At one stage, uh, Sue's daughter 
said to the council, uh, look, you know, you're being really hard on mum and, you know, she's coming across as, as someone that she isn't and I wish she could just, you know, be a bit nicer to her. And uh, he said, you better tell your mother that if she doesn't pull up her socks, she'll be leaving here in an ambulance. That's what he said, you know, and I, I just couldn't believe that when I said he was so angry with her. Why is that? I mean, you... You were, you know, you know, Sue. You were visiting Sue days ago. Yes. Now, in our brief conversation so far, you've mentioned that Bob's kids were unhappy with Sue. They feel as though Sue talked him into buying this big boat. Her own council didn't like her much. People in the courtroom didn't like her. How is it possible that on this complete lack of evidence, she was convicted and given a very stern sentence, a very long sentence very. for this crime, you know, that there's not much evidence against her. Why don't people like Susan Neil Fraser? Well, to, to understand that, you, you sort of need to understand the psychology of the Tasmanian population. I lived there for 10 years and my father was establishment, that's capital E, and uh, my husband was non-establishment. He was State Secretary of the ALP and my father was a brigadier in the army and then he retired and he became, you know, the head of the National Trust. And so I was lucky. I had one foot in each camp <laughs> and I was a nurse, so nurses, you know, are popular anyway. Everyone loves nurses. Everyone loves nurses. Yeah. So um, then I went to uh, work for the Guide Dogs for the Blind as a fundraiser and uh, I started to realise this great big uh, schism between the establishment and others in Tasmania. So it depended on where I went in the community, whether I introduced myself as Keith Coleman's daughter or Eugene Alexander's wife, because that would introduce you to the to the group that you were talking to. So there's a very strong group of people in Tasmania called, which we loosely call the establishment with Big E, and um, they've all gone to the same schools, they've all gone to the same uni, they all know each other, they're either in business or in one of the professions and they look after each other. And you don't have to actually ask if they're in the establishment or not, they know. They know each other and they look after each other. Now, Sue was very establishment. She had horses. She had a pony uh, riding business. Uh, she wore pearls and twin sets. Her mother came from a family of, of um, Hobart people who went right back to the convict days but didn't have the convict stain. They were Hayes. And so you get, you get to know the surnames and so, oh, yeah, one of the Hayes, right, oh, she was uh, mm. very up market, you know, um, sort of aloof person. She, she, um, her, her mother married a, a Scot and she went and lived in Scotland for a while and she was taught very much the stiff upper lip sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. And so when she was in the witness box, she was a bit like the old Lindy Chamberlain story, you know, didn't cry, didn't look as if she was devastated. She just, you know, had this sort of fairly flat affect and, you know, didn't really try to defend herself and, and break down. And the jury didn't like her. She didn't beg. No, by she the didn't beg, didn't that, cry. Yeah. You know, because she never expected that she'd be found guilty. And neither, neither did anyone else. So when when the verdict was announced and the, and the sentence, I mean, everyone was gobsmacked. So off she went to jail. What happened after she was... Um, sentenced to 26 years, no one could believe it. I no. mean, they just, oh, we'll appeal, you know, she'll get off on appeal. It's ridiculous, la, 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 there's no evidence, there's no nothing. And so when the appeal came up, they took three years off her sentence but didn't change the guilty finding at all. So she's still gone back to prison. They went to the High Court. She was refused leave to appeal to the High Court. High Court couldn't see any reason why, you know, they would make a decision against what the Appeal Court judges had said, so she wasn't even allowed to have an appeal in the High Court. So in Australia, in most states, once you've done that route, so trial, appeal, High Court for review, you're done. And unless you've got a very active group on the outside who's agitating to try and help you get out of jail if they think that you're innocent, then you're gone. You just rot in jail, do your sentence and, you know, and I've interviewed a lot of people in that situation over the years. In South Australia a few years ago, the law was changed to allow a prisoner who had what's called compelling new evidence, fresh and new evidence, that may have come to light after their process had compl been completed to 
ask leave to make one more appeal. So you have to actually seek leave first and then if the judge, single judge hearing that application thinks, yeah, okay, this, this fills into the fresh and compelling evidence box, then they will grant leave. Then you have to do the whole appeal again with this new evidence to the appeal bench, which is three judges usually. So in South Australia that was brought in because of Henry Keogh and he was uh, in prison doing, he, I think he did had justice and others don't, and so it goes. So if in this case uh, fresh and compelling evidence was brought forward, then um, the uh, judge should uh, recommend that she has another appeal. Mm. Well, the fresh and compelling evidence mainly relied on the fact that Megan Vass, mm. remember her, yes. the girl with the DNA, yes. she came forward and she said that she was on the boat that night. Boat. Why did she come forward? Uh, well, I think she was kind of persuaded. but <laughs> um, With cash? Uh, no, I don't think so. She's a very scared little person mm. and um, there were a lot of people hassling her to, to tell the truth. And one of the people who was hassling her was a prison inmate who was in the garden doing some work with Sue and she was very fond of Sue because Sue treated her as a person. And so Karen, her name is, um, she was gardening with Sue and Sue said to Karen, You'll never believe this, but they've identified the girl who whose DNA it was mm. and we're trying to get her to say whether she was on the boat or not. And Karen, who was getting out in, you know, weeks from this conversation, she said, oh, I know that Megan Vass. She said, I'll go and talk to her and get her to tell her story. So Sue was overcome by with joy and she said, would you do that? And, and unfortunately for Karen, Sue said, look, when I get out, I'll help you. She said, I'll buy you a house. And, of course, suddenly it went from Karen doing her a favour for no reason other than justice to what was perceived by people as being a Sue bribing her to try and force um, Megan to tell the truth. And it's been a very rocky road for Karen for that reason and, you know, she's still um, going through that process. And What you... process? What do you mean? That... Well, she's she's been charged with perverting the course of justice. Wow. And that's a really serious charge. I mean, you can do 15 years for mm. that and they just won't hear it. They keep... It keeps, she keeps going back to prison, back to court because she's on bail. She keeps going back to court and every day, yeah, just extend the bail, extend the bail because they don't want to hear her case or another case of a, of a um, lawyer who was raided by the police and he was also trying to get Megan to tell the truth and they took all his stuff and all his papers, his personal computer, everything, and he was charged with pervert the course of justice as well. Then there was another lawyer who did a lot of pro bono work for Sue found some witnesses that hadn't come forward before and then she was brought up before the court by the Legal Profession Board and questioning her tactics in another case and they hounded her and hounded her until she just resigned her legal practising certificate and said she didn't want to do law in that state. So we had three people who were intimidated by the police, legally intimidated, because they came forward to try and help Sue. and um, But none of this changes the fact that Miss Vass... Was on the boat. Was on the boat and she says that she was on the boat she with was. two men mm -hmm. and she saw one of them assault Bob Yes, and that she saw a lot of blood. That's correct. And so she gave this statement to the lawyer who was harassed and raided. Subsequently, she gave it to a former uh, police detective turned uh, investigator uh, and turned uh, book writer called Cl Colin McLaren. Um, and so Colin McLaren also followed up and got uh, Megan to confess to him that she was on the boat with Sam Devine and another person. So Paul Rowe, in fact, who had the boat nearby. And that's her story. So this kind of changed a lot of things. Uh, there were other there was other evidence given at the uh, leave to appeal application, such as the fact that the luminol uh, reacted with something other than blood in the dinghy and the jury never heard that. And there were other forensic issues that were, you know, right up the spout. Uh, really poorly executed policing. So eventually someone persuaded Megan Vass to do a, a spot on 60 Minutes and confess to Australia that she was on the boat.
25-year-old Megan Vass has lived a wretched existence. For half her life, home has been the streets, where she's mixed with the wrong crowd and been addicted to heavy drugs. But Megan could be the most important witness in Tasmania's most controversial murder case. I can remember being on board and the person that I was with had obviously been spotted by Bob. I don't know, been told to piss off. They've had an argument, it's escalated. He's hit Bob, I don't know what with. So he struck him? Quite a few times, I think. Probably 20 minutes or so. 20 minutes? And about, um... It went on for a while. Yeah. And then I saw, I saw a lot of blood, but I can't, I can't give any more than that, I can't remember. The guy you were with was hitting Bob Chappell. Can you remember what he was hitting him with? No. And, and did you try to break it up? I, I would have told, I would have told, the bloke that I was saying to stop or to calm down, but there's only so much I could do. I'm only small and he was a bigger bloke. And it was just I couldn't get him to calm down, you know. And, and what was your reaction to that? That's when I've thrown up the vomit. Megan says seeing an elderly man murdered was so frightening it made her physically ill. She vomited on the deck of the Four Winds an act which branded her DNA to the yacht. What, what was the second man doing? Oh, I gathered that the bloke that I was with just, just called him down to the cabin. Did you go back to shore while they were dealing with that or did you stay on the boat? I must have gone back to shore, but I can't, I can't recollect how. But, but you know that Bob Chapel was killed by one of the men you were with. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Are you certain about that? Yes. And of course they thought the boat was empty because Correct. there was no dinghy, no Zodiac or anything yep. on the boat. And it was a brand new boat. It had only been in, in the harbour uh, for probably three weeks. Mm. And of course everyone was thinking, wow, this is a rich big boat, you mm. know, there could be something good on here. So that's why they went, I'm sure. So we're now at a situation where the judge did not see... 60 Minutes, he said he didn't watch that, but he did receive the statutory declar declaration from Megan that confirmed what she said on 60 Minutes, and so that, along with the other forensic evidence that was raised during the long process of leave seeking leave to appeal, was granted by the judge, and I think it was granted around about March this year, it might have been earlier, mm. and everyone thought, oh, we still be out of jail on bail, and, you know, they're all hoping that she's going to be able to go home and spend time with her daughter and grandchildren who've all been born since she's been in prison. Mm. She's done nearly 10 years now, mm. and... Uh, the thing was, I rang Tom Percy, who's her pro bono barrister from Western Australia, very famous um, uh, crusader for truth and justice, and I said to Tom, well, you know, when are you going to let... When are you going to apply to get her out? And he said, well, it's not that simple, Robin, because she's um, a convicted murderer, she's not con considered a fit and proper person to be released into the community until her appeal is he heard. So... She's just sitting there, and I said to him, well, you know, when do you think it'll be? And he said, oh, with the legal process, it could be two years. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, and it's proving to be quite possible because so far there's been no application made by the people supporting her in, in Melbourne, um, mainly Paul Galbally, who's a very well-known uh, solicitor, but he's been caught up with the, with the Pell case, and so they have to prepare the application before she can even get a court date. Mm. So, And then it gets very busy in Tasmania in October in the courts because they have this sort of special time between October and December where they push a lot of cases through that have been hanging around and they, they have a sort of intense trial period. Mm. So the chances of her getting on before Christmas now are pretty slim. Oh. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's so it's slow, isn't it? The yes. old wheels of justice—they grind along. They do, and it's frustrating for us, but we're not sitting in Risdon Prison no, in our right. wheelchair, desperate to get out and see our family. And yep. 
She's not on, you know, Sue is not the only person who's in this situation no. around Australia. There are a lot of people, between 1% and 3% of people in prison in Australia are doing time for crimes they didn't commit. Murder on the Derwent is the excellent book by Robin Bowles and there's so much more in the book that we didn't have time to talk about on the show, so you still have to buy it. Robin will be back on the show in a couple of weeks to talk about another case. Thank you for downloading this episode of Australian True Crime. We'll be back next week. <laughs>